in it and you want to understand the variation. You want to understand the variation of um, the, uh, the data over time, then line chart is your best bet. So you can compare the variation over time as well. You can compare multiple charts or multiple um, multiple quantities over time. So next, we have our um, bar charts. When do we use bar charts? Of course, when we want to show data distribution. For instance, we want to show whether um, this uh, this particular um, this particular uh, category or this particular segment is more than the other. Maybe uh, we have like five categories or maybe 10 categories or even 50 categories and we want to see the distribution of each of the categories. So let me give a, a simple example. Say we have um, the population of uh, Nigerians. So we now divided it into um, kids, age zero to 10, um, adolescents, age 10 to um, 18, um, youth, age 18 to age 30, adults, age 30 to 50, aged 50 and above. We want to know um, what's the distribution of each of these categories in Nigeria. So um, we, okay, we find that maybe youth make up, um, say, uh 30 percent of the total population uh the adolescents make up 15 percent uh the what's the next category again the youths make up say 18 percent the adult so this is actually distribution how these categories are distributed in the population so next we have um Pie chart. Just a moment, please. Yeah. So we have pie charts. Let me be sure I've not skipped any. Okay, yeah, pie charts. Use pie charts to show parts of a whole. I mean, uh, we've been seeing pie, pie charts um, all through our school days from nursery to primary to, so everywhere we see pie charts. Um, simple example of pie charts as you see illustrated in our school days is um, an orange where it is sliced uh, into halves. So you can have parts of a whole. Or I think a more relatable example is um, is um what's it called again? Is um why did I forget this? Say again. Pizza. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Pizza. Exactly. So it's a very classical example of um, pie charts where each person could just pick one or two parts. So parts of a whole pie chart. That's it. Suitable to. It can't show the trend. That's one important thing about it. Don't try to show um, data that you want to find the trend in it. So, but if you want to show how much part of the whole does this category or this quantity constitute, then pie chart is um, the go-to chart for that. Scatter plots, very useful to show relationship between numerical variables. Um, if you if you uh, a data analyst or a machine learning engineer or data scientist, it's a chart that you find especially useful when you're exploring your data to identify um, features that are useful for your analysis. So by plotting two or more, I mean, two quantities together in a scatter plot, you will get an intuition as to whether um, there's any relationship or um, it's just excessively um, random. Now, tools for data visualization. Of course, we have um, certain business intelligence tools. 
um, that's uh, useful for preparing and even visualizing big data um, in form of dashboards. They make, they make it quite easy to handle big data to process it, to kind of create processing pipeline and uh, display that data. I mean, you could also set it that it will be refreshing at intervals. So some popular examples are Power BI, which most of us know about, Tableau as well. Then we have Luca as well as Click View. I mean, Click View. So these are the um, some of the commonest uh, BI tools. Of course, there are many more. And um, so because the uh, discussion here is data violation in Python, so we will be delving into um, the tools in Python, the libraries in Python for visualizing data. And some of the commonest ones are Matplotlib, uh, which is based on MATLAB. Then we have um, Seaborn, which is an abstraction of Matplotlib. Then we have Plotly, which is especially useful for creating interactive um, dashboards or interactive charts. Uh, it's, it's, it gives the closest experience to the BI tools listed up there because you can kind of in, inspect um, each point on your charts and get some descriptions, right? It's unlike Matplotlib and Seaborn that are static in nature. Then we have um, ggplot, uh, which is also um, quite makes uh, creating charts quite easy. Then bouquet as well, bouquet, which is um, quite useful for, I mean, which is also like partly for creating interactive um, visuals. So a bouquet and plotly also make it easy to create deployable visuals. So if you are a software engineer or a machine learning engineer who wants to build visuals and uh, productionize it, like um, maybe kind of create your Power BI kind of feel. So you want to create a web interface where people can um, drill through, can filter your chart and all of that. Plotly is a good candidate for that. So going further, we will discuss the components of the Matplotlib figure. So Matplotlib is one of the commonest, it's even the commonest, it's the most popular uh, data visualization library in Python. Yeah, so we'll discuss the components, the anatomy of um, its figure. So right here on the screen, we have, um, let's look at the, the entire figure as a whole, which is just called a figure. Well, I mean, we call anatomy of a figure and it's called a figure. That's like the uh, building block or that's the first thing that gets created when you're trying to create a Matplotlib plot in Python. So you first create the, whether you do it explicitly or even if you don't, the, pro, the library would implicitly create it. So the figure is, think of it as everything you see here, but not necessarily with anything on it. It may not have anything on it at the start, but just having the outline, that's the, that's the first thing, the figure itself. Now, we have the title at the topmost side, which is quite intuitive. At the top right corner here, oh, beg your pardon, sorry. At the top right corner, we have um, the legend. You can see it there with the description. Then um, just below it, we have grid. We can see the inter um, intersection of the grid lines there both the vertical and horizontal um, lines that make the grid. So grid makes it sometimes easier to um, trace values on the chart. Then to the left, on the left axis, on the, on the, on the Y axis, the left, leftmost part of it. So we have the major tick, which is the line that extends out that indicates four. Then we have the minor tick, which um, is usually a smaller um, division in between the major ticks. So we have three here marked as major tick label. So the label for this major tick, the line that um, um, is to the right of three, that's the major tick, and three itself is the label of it. 
Then we have Y axis label here. Then we have, of course, the figure, I've explained what the figure is, the entire thing itself, the entire platform on which this chart is built is called figure. Then we have um, axis. So axis is um, the intersection of the X and Y planes, where you have X and Y planes together, or even more, multiple planes. So you have an axis. If you have two or more planes, two or more axes, when I say axis, that's singular axis, two or more singular axis together, then you have axis with ES. So we have line plot, which is just a line, as we can see here. Then we have um, markers, as we can see, small circles scattered around for scatter plots. Then we have an um, X axis at the base of the screen, and we have the X axis ticks. Um, give me a moment, please. Put this down. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. My my baby just increased the volume of his um, cartoon play. Yeah. So uh, going further, so this is just the anatomy of a of a figure, and it really helps to understand it. So you know what to um, search for if you're trying to create certain things. Now let's look at creating a matplotly plot. Um, to the right we can see a sample code for creating the chart we have on the left. So what we have is a basic line chart. We're importing the Matplotly PyPlot um, module of the library, and we're importing NumPy. The essence of importing NumPy is to generate the data which we're, in, which we're visualizing here. is to generate the data which we're visualizing. So the first um, two lines were importing the libraries we need. Then the next three lines, we're creating the data. So T for time or for just, um, let's say our X axis, uh, which is um, just a range of numbers zero to two separated or which are 0 0.01 distance apart. So it starts from 0 0.0, then 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03 till two. So you'd have 200 points. And we have an S1, which is um, a sine of two times pi. Basically we're creating a sine wave here. And uh, yeah, in the two, S1 and S2 are two sine waves just that um, S2 is twice, um, is just um, projected, is a projected version of S1. Now, first thing, let's look at the next five lines. So we're creating a figure. I told you the first thing to create is a figure. It's usually not necessary to do that first. If you don't do it, it is created implicitly. But here we're doing it explicitly. We're creating a figure. And we say, okay, we're creating a single figure. Then we're adding subplots. So um, Matplotlib allows you almost any plot, even, any, any plotting library allows you to add subplots, create multiple plots on a single figure. So we're adding a subplot here. What's the subplot? We have um, two by one. Basically means two rows. If you look at we have two rows, then one column. So two by one. And we say this is the first one. So the first, okay, let's look at it, two, one, one. Two there means two rows. One there means two columns. Then the last one there means, okay, we are accessing the first of the um, rows, which is this. So this now, we're now saying plot T and S1 on it. And here we repeated the same thing, accessing the second one and plotting T and two times of S1 on it. And two times of S1 is actually the same as S2 here. I could have just written S2 and it would have worked. Yeah. So um, moving on to the next 
would um, investigate creating the same chart using Seaborn. Now, I mentioned earlier that Seaborn is an abstraction of Matplotlib. What I mean by that is Seaborn allows us to create charts using fewer, um, fewer um, expressions. Basically, you can do the same thing you can with Matplotlib, but without having as many code and without writing as many code as you would with Matplotlib. In addition to that, Seaborn um, has some nice defaults for your chat. Unlike Matplotlib that seems to be bare bone, Seaborn has some really nice defaults for most of the chats. And even some instances it allows you to create multiple chats with a single um, line of instruction. So um, that's uh, really a nice um, feature of Seaborn and why um, a lot of people find it, um, I mean, prefer to make use of it to using uh, Matplotlib. Although Matplotlib, of course, gives you greater control. Yeah, so thank you. This brings us to the end of uh, my presentation. I, um, you, I hope you had a, a nice time listening to it. Yes, we, we had to Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ridwan. Um, that was an insightful presentation. I believe the Python developers amongst us have picked up ten or two. So, um, if you have any questions, um, you can drop them in the chat box. Um, after the, after both presentations, we'll be taking questions. Um, or if you want to unmute your mic and ask questions after the presentations, that one is also welcome. So, moving on to the next speaker, he is um. Moments. Okay, our next speaker is Adi Emi Michael. He is uh, graduated from Command D Secondary School, Oshodi, and um, he is a Python developer from Dev Center. So, um, Michael, if you can hear us, this is your time. Please come on and give us your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Michael. Yeah, can anyone hear me? Yes, Michael. Can you? Okay. Um, so um, I want to use this opportunity to thank Bincom for this um, opportunity. Um, it's a privilege for me being a speaker in today's event, which is the data science um, event. Um, so we'll be talking about data visualization with Python. So let me share my screen so we can go along. Okay, can, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen, Michael. Yes, okay. yes, you can. Okay. Um, so we'll be talking about data visualization with Python. Um, so this is an overview of what we'll be talking about today. We'll be talking about what data is, what is visualization, what data visualization is, the types of data visualization we have, um, why do we use data visualization? Um, the tools used in data visualization and why do we use Python for data visualization? Okay, now um, what is data visualization? Um, so, and what is data? A data is defined as facts or figures or information or used by a computer. Uh, basically, when we were in secondary school, we were taught that that in computer that data is um, are facts and figures or information that are stored in uh, stored in or used by a computer. Uh, let me give an example of what we are talking about here. Um, when you talk about a data, um, for instance, you there's a company who has a vacancy um, in their company and they publicize this um, 
this information and say ah, they have um, a vacant space in their company. Now, you as a person, you that see this, um, um, this, you either see this in whether it's either in a post or maybe online or maybe while passing, you just see a flyer of the, them having a vacant position in their organization. So, as a person, you, you tend to uh, submit your CV to that company. Now, the, that CV is an information about you. The organization may have not seen you before, but you submitting your CV, it's yeah, information about you. It's, so, the organization will look at this CV and see if you are being qualified for this um, post or for this vacant um, position. So um, basically, that is what data is. Information about a particular um, thing. So um, data are used in almost everything we do in our day-to-day -day activity. And data are used in scientific researches. They are used in business management, like e.g. sales data, revenue, profits, stock price, finances, uh, governance, e.g. crime rates, um, unemployment rate, literacy rate, and in virtually every other form of human organizational activity, um, e.g. census of the number of homeless people per non uh, homeless people by non profit organization. So um, what is visualization? Now, visualization is a technique for creating images, diagrams, or animation to communicate a message. Um, so, we look at this um, diagram or this image on our screen. We see that this is an unemployment rate um, chart in Nigeria. We can see from 2015 to 2020, we can see that the rate of unemployment is going it's increasing every year so um for a youth for youth or graduating students seeing this chart they will look at it and they will be able to know that no one is um depending on white scholar jobs anymore so um youth and young uh, youth and um graduating students looking at this chart they know that they have to get something doing in the sense that they have to get a an handwork doing or going to tech because you are in the era of tech so um finding a handwork doing it will keep you busy and give you something doing and if it's tech you are going to if um you are looking for a very um good place to learn tech I will really recommend you to join Bincom to learn this tech because Bincom is a very um, good place to learn tech. Um, another example of this visualization is um, talking about this um, crime rates in the society. Let's take, for instance, um, a year before we um, notice that the crime rate of a society is 40%. Now, a year after, we see that that crime rate is 60%. Now, looking at this um, chart, you will know that you find out that the crime rate in, in that society is, is increasing every year. So it will give um, the armed forces um, to give them this um, idea or to give them while looking at this um, chart, it to make them look at this chart and look for ways to, in, to decrease the crime rate of that society. So basically, visualization is just a technique of what creating images or charts or diagrams to communicate a message to um to people. Now, what is data visualization? Okay, basically, data visualization is the graphical representation of information and data by using visual elements like charts, graphs, and maps. 
data visualization tools, they provide an accessible way to see and understand trends, outliners, and patterns in data. Now, um, data visualization, it's, um, it's a way of, so um, data visualization is a way of gathering information. Then after gathering this information, you try to represent them graphically so that it could be easier for people to understand what you are trying to say or trying to um, do. So data visualization, you can either do this um, represent, graphical representation, either in a line chart, um, in a graph, or in a map. Take, for instance, the um, example I gave earlier on the um, crime, um, crime rates. Now, visualizing that, and if um, you see that type of visualization, you see that chart, you will know that um, the crime rate of, is, of that society is increasing um, every year. So um, data visualization is just um, a process of, or a technique by which you represent this information in a graphical way. Now data visualization refers to the techniques used to communicate data or information by encoding it as visual objects and points, lines, or bars containing graphics. So um, what are the types of data visualization? Basically, we have, there are many types of data visualization. And the most common um, types of data visualization are scatter plots, line graphs, pie charts, bar charts and heat map. Um, the first speaker talked about most of these um, types of data visualization. So, but let's go on. Scatter plot. Um, a scatter plot, which is known as a scatter chart or a scatter graph, it uses dots to represent values for two different numerical variables. And the position of each dot on the horizontal and vertical axis indicates values for an individual data point. Now, scatter plots are used to observe relationship between variables. Um, so this is an example of a scatter plot, whereby you have the value of X and the value of Y. So you are going to, you are trying to look for the relationship between these two variables which are the value of X and the value of Y. Um, now, this is data of um, children above the age of 18. Now, we are trying to, you can see here, this are um, a chart. This is um, a collection of information about the children above the age of 18. Now, if you look at it, we want to plot um, the age against the internet usage for each of these um, children at the age of above the age of um, 18. Now, if you see this chart, you can see from the chart that children at the age of, let's say, 18 to um, somewhere like 34 or 33. The hours they use, the internet usage is very high. It's like, it's from the range of, um, let's say, from seven, eight hours to 20 hours per week. So what is trying to tell that children at the age of 18 to 33, they use the internet, very, they use it almost every time. Why from the age of um, 42 or 40, yeah, 42 to 45, you can see that the minimum hour of um, our um, um, the minimum usage of the internet is one, let's say one hour. So basically, this is like this is this is a form of scatter plot. Um, so. This, what does this do? It's trying to show you the hours of, um, the number of hours, um, the ages of 18 and above 
the, our, none of our use um, use the internet. Um, we talk about another um, type, which is line graphs. Now, a line graph is graphical display of information that changes continuously over time. Within a line graph, there are points connecting the data to show a continuous change. Now, this is an example of a line graph. Um, it's showing the hot dog sold per day. Now, it's number of hot dogs per um, against the days, days of the week. Now, you could see that from Monday, on Monday, they were, they were able to sell 10 hot dogs. Tuesday, they sold 30 hot dogs. Wednesday, they sold 30. Thursday, they sold um, 50. And Friday, they sold 17. So, um, what? So this um, type of graph, which is the line graph, it's not constant. It varies. Now, for, for them, to, they sold um, on Monday 10 hot dogs. It doesn't mean that in the following weeks, they are still going to sell these same 10 hot dogs. No, it varies. The highest um, number of hot dogs they sold was 70, uh, which was on Friday. Now, in following weeks, Wednesday could be the highest um, um, day they sold hot dogs. And yeah, it's zero to 90. It might be that Wednesday they might sell 150 hot dogs a day. So um, when you talk about line graphs, it doesn't, it's not constant, it varies. Let's look at another one, which is um, the push-up line chart. Now, this is the number of push-ups against number on the, against the days of the week. Now, if you see that um, someone who is, uh, is this, this person is working out, and Sunday is 25 push-ups, Monday is 15 push-ups, Tuesday is 25, Wednesday did um, push-ups, Thursday did 10 push-ups, Friday zero, and Saturday did 20. Now, if you look at this um, chart, you can see that the chart goes up and comes down. Now, this um, person doing the push-up is not constant. He does 25 today, he does 15 tomorrow, he does 25 again, and does five. So now, looking at this chart, you can look at it and say, if I ask a question now that, what um, day of the week did it do the least amount of push up Can someone answer that question? Hello? Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Michael. What was the question again? Yeah, the question is, now from this push-up um, chat, can anyone tell me the least day that this person did um, yeah, the push-up? Tuesday. No, the least. That was oh, Friday. 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 Yeah. Friday. So looking at this chart, now I'm trying to, as you are looking at this chart, we're not there when we were doing the push up. But from looking at this um, chart, you can, you can see that Friday is the day is the least push up. While um, we can say Sunday and Tuesday are the days you did the most push up. So, and uh, there's something you have to note in line graphs. Why dealing with line graphs? You must, it's very important to have a title. From this um, example, I do. The first one has the title, all dogs sold per day, and the second one has the title, push ups. Now, why do we need to put a title in these line graphs? We need to put a title in this line graph because that title now gives us an information of what we are trying to visualize. Now, if I don't put um, a title in this hot dogs sold per day, many of us don't understand what I'm trying to talk about. But putting a title in a line graph is going a way of saying that this um, title shows that 
this is what we are talking about. It shows the important uh, details of this um, visualization um, we are trying to do. We have another um, type of chart, which is the pie chart. Um, a pie chart is a type of graph that displays data in a circular graph. Um, the pieces of the graph are proportional to the fraction of the whole in each category. Um, the first speaker talked about it where, yeah, when we in um, school growing up, we use oranges where we slice those oranges into two, into three. Then uh, a good example is the pizza. So that's like how pie chart is. Now, look at this example. We have the example of pie and pet ownership. Now we have animals, different animals. We have the dogs, cats, fish, rabbits, and rodents. Now, from this, um, looking at this um, chart, we see that dogs have the highest owners in this pie chart, followed by the cats, then we have the fishes, then the rabbit, the rodents. So most owners, they have, uh, most pet owners, they have dogs as their pets. Then you see cats, then some few cases you see fishes. Then rodents are really like the least and uh, this um, graph that we are looking at. So um, why do we do data visualization? Now, data visualization is important because it allows trends and patterns to be easy to see. Machine learning makes it easier to conduct analysis such as predictive analysis, which can then serve as helpful visualization whether you work in finance, marketing, tech, design, or anything else, you need to visualize. Um, let me give an example. I was privileged to um, travel to Ife like maybe three or four years ago. And um, I, I was in Ife with, um, so I was in Ife with one of my friends. So um, we, I think, the, there were two um, two restaurants. I think one was a canteen and the other was a restaurant. And it was um, situated in a school, like I think a polytechnic or a university, situated around that university. So um, in that, um, in Ife, there, we had uh, one of the canteen. The canteen was like this mama put, and the other one was the restaurant. Now this um, restaurant, a plate of food was 1,000. And uh, in uh, mama put 200, 250, 300, you, you can get a plate of food there. Now, looking at those two different, um, there's um, two different um, scenarios. You can see that one is a canteen, one is um, a restaurant. Now, while, while I was in Ife, I noticed that most students go to this um, um, canteen to eat rather than going to um, the restaurant. Why? Because even as a student, you know that why Living, while living as a student, you try to manage things. You don't live like a pompous person, like a king, while you are um, in school as a student. So many um, people, they tend to go to this canteen to eat. And looking at this um, restaurant, this the owner of the restaurant has to look at it that, ah, look at it. And many people are tending towards this canteen. And, Looking at my own um, restaurant, there's no one coming to buy from me. Why are people not buying from the restaurant, person, uh, the owner of this restaurant? Because of the, um, the food that this person is selling is on the high side. And so the person who, uh, owner of this restaurant, has to look at it and say, okay, well, I have to, for him not to have a, um, a um, loss in this, in its, in its restaurant, 
for it not to have loss, it has to reduce that, um, reduce the amount of, um, reduce the amount which it gives to a plate of food, reduce it to 500 naira. And 500 naira basically is still on the high side a bit, but it's, well, it was still able to reduce it to 500 and it was still able to get some customers. There's what they call target audience. Now, target audience means um, getting like what your customer wants, what your customer likes, you give it to them. Now, for this scenario which I gave, that is not a good location for that type of restaurant. Taking that type of restaurant to um, open like the main, uh, main road or maybe like close to um, and yeah, taking it to a main road where by people pass, they come, they just they are they want to take. So that um, taking that um, restaurant to a to the main road is a better location than bringing it to where students are. So um, data visualization is all about getting um, information, then visualizing it. Um, visualizing it in a way that people can understand what we are talking about. So, um, why do we, so now I'm talking about why data visualization is important. It's important because it makes us see trends, useful trends, and makes us um, see patterns in these data sets we are talking about. Uh, let me give another example. I was working on a data set, which is a Titanic data set. Um, this Titanic data set is all about um, people who were embarking on the journey um, and the mode of transportation was on water, which they were using a ship. So um, on this Titanic data set on this ship is why going on the journey, the ship capsided. And why the ship capsided? So I was trying to look at it that okay how many people survived like the rate of like if um the people who survived in this titanic data set now while plotting uh, my graphite doing the visualization i noticed that more of the females survived than the males so i was not like okay now i want to now categorize this i can't just say male and female i categorize them into like different categories whereby I, I look for these males, we have boys and men. So in the boys and men, who survived more? I, I did the boys, men, um, the female, the girls and the female. I noticed that the men were the ones who died more or they were not able to survive in that Titanic data set. Um, but the females are the ones who survived the more females and the girls, but the men are the ones who didn't survive more. And looking at it again, I was like, okay, if a person should embark on that journey now, and the person is a male, so the person won't be able to survive. So data visualization is just about picturing, like visualizing what the information you have gotten, visualizing it for people to see so that you can see the useful patterns and the trends in which this data set is going. Um, data visualization uses visual data to communicate information in a manner that is universal, fast, and effective. This practice can help companies identify which areas need to be improved, which factors affect customer satisfaction and dissatisfaction, and what to do with specific products, where should they go, and who should they be sold to. Now, um, for the scenario I gave, which was that, if the scenario in Ife, which I gave that there were two restaurants, which one, one was a canteen, and the other was a restaurant. Now, to, uh, for the one who, for the restaurant, it's, I said it earlier on that it's not a, um, good location for that kind of um, restaurant. So, if um, for the canteen, the canteen is a place it's situated in a good um, location 
because it's going to see customers always. And now, satisfaction and dissatisfaction of um, um, visualization also improves the factors where customers um, are being satisfied or dissatisfied. And the said that, okay, well, I talked about target audience. Now, if, for instance, you have a child and you are selling, let's say, a child of um, um, three, or three, four, five years old, and you are selling or you are bringing, like, selling that child a car, that child, not, that child won't value that type of um, uh, gift you are giving it to because that child is um, on their age and will not look at, will not see that as a useful thing. That is not a useful thing. But giving that child toys, video games, it will look at it's useful for that child because that is like you are targeting the, or you are targeting the audience. Now for that child is under the age of um, three, uh, is under the age of five. So where, so um, for data visualization, we should know where to target. We should know what to be sold to people and who we should visualize to. If we're visualizing to a child, we should know what to visualize to a child. We should know the things to that we are going to visualize to this child. If we're visualizing to an adult, to a data scientist, or you know how to um, place all these um, visualization processes. Now, the tools used in data visualization, you have the tabular, the local, the Zoho analytics, the SciSense and IBM Cognas analytics. Um, we have, now, why do we use Python for visualization, for data visualization? Now, Python offers multiple great graphing libraries that come packed with lots of different features. We have the Matplotlib. Um, Matplotlib is the most popular Python plotting library. It is especially good for creating basic graph, graph um, basic graphs like line charts, bar charts, histograms, and many more. We have the Pandas. Pandas is also a library used in data visualization. It's an open source, high performance, easy to use library providing data structures such as data frames, such as data frames. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, so pandas visualization makes it really easy to create plots out of a pandas data frame and series. We have the Seaborn. Now the Seaborn is a Python data visualization library based on Matplotlib. It, it provides a high level interface for creating attractive graphs. Uh, Seaborn has a lot of offer, a lot to offer. It's standard designs and also it's, it's standard designs are awesome. And it also has a nice interface for working with Pandas data frames. Um, Seaborn and Matplotlib are almost the same, but they have some slight differences. Uh, Seaborn is used to, uh, it's used to, um, how would I put it? It's used to create complex graphs. Like when you're talking about visualizing um, some graphs and compl some complex graphs, you use Seaborn. But Matplotlib is used for creating basic graphs like graphs for maybe you want to, um, for example, of graphs like the one I talked about, the number of hot dogs, they are like basic graphs. But when you talk about big data, or uh, dealing with the big data, you use Seaborn to, um, to visualize your data. And Seaborn contains a few plots and patterns for data visualization. Why in Matplotlib? Data sets are visualized with the assistance of lines, scatter plots, pie charts, histogram, and bar graphs. Um, another reason why we use Python is because it has a large community. Um, Python has a large community in the sense that when you have problems, when you have difficulties, you could just reach out to 
people. Like an example of the communities you know, we have in Python, the Stack Overflow, where you have problems, you put your um, you put your um, this thing, you try to um, put your problem on this Stack Overflow, then you put it as a like as a question, then people are going to respond to and try to look at how they could help you fix the problem you are trying to that you are having. Um, another reason is that it is an easy programming language. Um, Python is an easy programming language in the sense that it's, it's the syntax are easy. Python is just as if you are interacting with someone. Just look at Python as if um, when you, you are talking to someone or about something. So that's how Python is. It's easy, it's an easy programming language and it's easy to understand. Um, so um, summary of um, what I'm talking about, what I've been talking about is that data visualization is very important because it helps us see trends and see patterns that are useful for visualization. Um, so, are there any questions? If there are any questions, please. If there are no questions, if there are no questions. Um, hello, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Michael. Um, okay, thank you so, for that. <coughs> thank you for that presentation. Um, we have some questions here in the chat box. First one is coming from. So when it goes to to you, Mr. Ridwan, it says data visualization works with data. What do you do in terms of missing data? How do you replace them? Or how does your model read NAN value? So that's the first question. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, missing data are quite common in uh, the data world. And uh, missing data are not handled automatically by the visualization libraries. It is your responsibility to handle missing data if you have them in your chart. Um, as, a, as a matter of fact, they would most likely be ignored depending on the libraries or they would throw error if you try to visualize data that have um, missing values. So that's the way because missing values cannot be interpreted to be anything. So they are either ignored or most times they throw error when you try to visualize such data with any end values that cannot be because they are, yeah, basically ignored or um, return error. So it's your responsibility to handle missing data, whether by dropping the values whether by replacing them with um, some domain, I mean, some values you be able to come up with based on your domain understanding, or maybe some statistical um, estimates. How that answers it. Um, so, so you said that um, we can undo missing values, mostly from, um, let me say, from a guess one, from statistics to, and you said something about raising it or bringing it down, right? Yes, correct. You can drop it entirely. If the missing values are quite few, you can, if there are, if there are few, you can drop or you can choose to use some reasonable estimate based on your understanding of the data or your domain expertise, or sometimes you can even interpolate. Um, you, can, you can make the column with missing data target and build a model that is going to estimate the missing values. So that's an option as well. For, um, well, basically that's it. Those are the things you can do to handle missing values in data. All right, the next question there is, um, you spoke on scattered plots, where is it most? mostly useful? Scatter plot, like I said, um, makes it easy to compare um, quantities 
two quantities. I'll give a, a simple example. If we want to know whether um, the concentration of, okay, let's, let's, con let's say if we want to know if um, older people take more risk in terms of investment than younger people. So we will take age as a quantity on one axis and the amount of money invested by each individual as another quantity on another axis. So when these two are plotted together on a scatter plot, so um, we, can, we can see trend if it exists. If it doesn't exist, we'll just have a cloud of data points scattered all around the place. And if we see maybe increasing trend, that could be an indication that there's a relationship. Even if there's decreasing trend, that was also an indication. Yeah, so that's an example of where it can be used. It can be used in so many contexts. If you have a numerical output you're trying to predict, especially regression, and you want to know, um, you want to know whether the output varies with a particular um, input variable. So you have multiple input, input variables. So you plot each of the input variables that are numerical against the target um, regressional output. So um, you would easily know whether such features hold any significant influence on the outputs. And yeah, so that's the way it can be um, utilized. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I hope you're clear on that. Are you? Yes, yes, I'm clear on that. Okay, um, another question here is um, which library is perfect for visualizing geospatial data? Geospatial data, yeah. So um, interestingly, I never visualized geospatial data, but I, I uh, took a sneak peek at the question and I um, did a Google search. So there's a library called Geo, GeoplotLib. Of course, there are many others. Right, and um, just the way I did it, a simple Google search would reveal many others, and um, most of them would do well. Uh, um, there is always not a best library for certain things, although sometimes there are certain libraries that do well in particular context. So it's your responsibility to take a look at all of them and see, okay, what particular kind of geospatial data do you want to visualize? Does this library have an easy interface for implementing it, for visualizing it by easy interface. Do I need to just maybe in a single line of code, can I get it done? Or do I need to spend time maybe uh, understanding how this component relates to this before I can visualize it? So those are the things. So take a look at the different libraries that exist. One of it is Geoplotlib, which is um, from my um, little research. I found it quite popular. So um, there are many others compare them or just take one and try to understand it and work with it. So that's it. All right, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? If you have a question, this is, um, this is the time for questions. If you have a question to ask either of the speakers. Uh, good the afternoon, question. everyone. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Let me do. Okay, uh, my question is: um, looking at the presentation on uh, on the vis visualization using uh, Python, uh, I I observe that it seems uh, this type of visualization is is doing something uh, is doing what uh, BI tools also do. Uh, like uh, Salahuddin mentioned, um, uh, Luca, ClickView, Power BI, and the likes. So he, he, I wanted to know, he, is there, um, are there aspects where Python is superior to BI tools or you can use them interchangeably in terms of visualization? Yeah. Okay, got that, thanks. Um, so most tools that exist uh, provide one benefit that the other existing ones do not a lot of times. It's very rare you see people creating a new tool that doesn't bring anything extra. It might not necessarily be superior to an existing one, 
but it might have just one small niche or one small use case it's um, suitable for. Now, uh, BI tools, they're called business intelligence tools. The main purpose of those tools is for business insights. And it's to visualize mainly big data. I made reference to that. But you as um, a data analyst who is um, trying to, I mean, who perhaps works, because um, say you want to uh, model data, you want to do some advanced or complex um, data transformation and all of that, that, and you also happen to be more proficient with Python, but say you still understand or you're still able to use BI to some Do mm -hmm. you want to start working in Python, then export your data to file, then take it to Power BI to plus such data? Or is it not easier? Say you're not, you not trying to um, plot a large data. It's not, it's not big data. It's not data. When, when I say big data, I mean data that could amount to gigabytes, which of course Python may not be able to handle properly. So if you don't want to do such, I mean, if you're not working on such kind of data, why do you want to, why would you want to move your data to um, a file or to database so that it can be visualized with um, a BI tool? I think it's easier to just um, visualize that data in Python and to make use of any of these libraries we have discussed on in this session. So that's um, the reason why you would most likely want to use um, these Python tools. In addition to that, uh, so while you are exploring your data as a data, data analyst or data scientist, your ultimate goal usually is not even to create a chart. Your ultimate goal is to develop a model, right? To create some inference or to create some insight, most, mostly model. So you don't want to um, start importing data, transform it, then go and um, visualize it in BI tool, then come back to continue to work on it. At the end of it, say you have your Jupyter notebook that has um, the what you've been experimenting on from start. Now, that Jupyter notebook would not have the visualization you just created using the BI tool, which is um, really not nice. If you were to share it with me, so you would share that file, that Power BI, I mean, you share the notebook with me that has your analysis in Python, then you now share a link or a PB, uh, PBIX file, PIBX file, Power BI, PBIX, beg your pardon, Power BI file, so I can load my Power BI, then visualize it. Yeah. So you don't want to do that. That's the reason why um, this Python library is important. In addition to that, so a library like Plotly and Bouquet make it possible to embed charts into your um, dash, into your um, website or into a website. So, and they are free. But something like, okay, Plotly is not entirely free, but to a, to a great extent, it is free. Power BI, you can't deploy Power BI without having an enterprise subscription. So that's also a downside. I don't know about um, Tableau. I don't know about uh, ClickB and the likes. But if you need to deploy um, your visualization, then you might want to go with tools that are open source. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, Ridwan. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, welcome. Uh, okay, while you have been introduced, if I heard correctly, I heard you worked in the banking sector too for a while, or you still work there. No, no. So, can you like give an example of like a problem or a task to do with visualization while in the banking sector? Or like a problem you handle? Using visualization. Yeah. If you can talk about interestingly, it. interestingly, if you work in a bank, one of the some of the most common things you would work on are actually business intelligence related. So um, executives, business managers, products owners, uh, leads and the likes of various uh, business units, 
they want insights into their products, how customers are using it, how they're generating income. Um, and so they have lots of questions. And if I will tell you, uh, I, I won't be exaggerating if I say uh, my unit has created close to 500 or even close to 1,000 chats or 1,000 uh, dashboards reports that are um, either uh, on Power BI or on Excel, usually on Power BI, or sometimes using some advanced tools like um, SQL Server um, reporting, uh, SSRS, SQL Server reporting studio. So these are the things we work with regularly. So it's something you'd find a lot of uh, use for in organizations. And when I say organization, I mean any organization, there's no organization that doesn't want to visualize data. So if I'm to give one example, particularly, um, yeah, so if I'm to give um, one example, uh, particularly, so I'll make reference to uh, a project on um, payment graph, payment graph. Now that payment graph, um, was a visualization that was um, was a project that um, visualized the way our customers made payments to themselves. So for each customer, you would be able to understand who are the customer who, or who are the people this customer transfers mostly to, whether within the bank or outside the bank. And one of the one of the uses of that um, report. Um, was for engagement and customer acquisition. So if we have um, a customer who is transferring often to, a, 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 to an individual from another bank, so that's really an opportunity to sell to that individual or to, to acquire that customer from another bank and have him have um, an account in our own bank so that our customer doesn't have to transfer to um, an account in another bank can incur transfer fee, right? As well as would also gain a new customer by so doing, right? So, and even not just gaining a new customer, if um, I pay 10 people regularly and eight of them use my bank, what's the chance that I would want to leave that bank to another bank? Knowing well that eight of the 10 people I regularly pay to use Access Bank or use any bank I'm working with. Do you understand? So that's, um, that's an example of something or a project we worked on using visualization. All right, thank you. Pleasure. Okay, um, are there any other questions from any other person? If you have a question, please, um, you can unmute your mic and ask, or you can drop it in the chat section. Okay, in the absence of any other questions, um, permit me to share my screen and make a presentation right now. I'm sure we're all doing the letter. Look at something like that. I signed. I signed. Okay, um, as we all know, this is an event um, powered by Bincom Dev Center. Um, Dev Center is a, is a multi location based training and development center for technology resources and uh, technology solutions. All right, we'll have various locations. First of all, virtually near you, like we are here now. Um, we'll have a location at Yaba. We have one at Ibadan, Rio State. We have at Kano State. We have at Kaduna, Ogun State, Delta State. And we also have plans in place to expand to many more locations. All right, some of our services include Bincom Academy, the Bincom Tech Internship, the Bincom Tech Apprenticeship, the Bincom Community Events and Projects. This is an example of um, one of the Bincom Community Events. And we have um, the Light Space. We have the Bincom Global Tech Program. 
we have the emigrates and we have the Bincom mentoring platform. All right, let's get down. Let's drill down to some of these services that Bincom Dev Center offers. All right, the first one there is the Bincom Academy, which is an intensive training program facilitated by Bincom Dev Center. Each technology or application development class is typically four weeks of intensive training, um, which employs a Montessori approach, all right, which means that um, for you to be in any of these classes, it means that you have a foreknowledge of, of say, let's, let's say you're, you're a participant in Python, you have a foreknowledge of Python. So whatever, however, or whatever knowledge you're going to be given in class would be, the classes would be in the form of an interactive session. So some of the classes available are there, you can see them on your screen. We have Python, we have mobile app, we have PHP, MySQL, and so on. To see the full list of classes available, kindly visit bincom.net slash academy. We have Lightspace, which is a co-working space that provides, provides helpful workspace intended to encourage collaboration and drive innovations in the startup ecosystem. We have spaces that is created and designed for various events like seminars, conferences, and get together. Um, we have this in, certain, in all of our locations, like I clearly stated earlier, um, we have a lot of locations and in all these locations, we have light space in each one of them. All right, then the next one there is being community events and projects. This is an example of, um, this is one of the being community events, this Python meetup. All right, so these events and projects are geared at giving back to the community and building the tech ecosystem. We focus on informing and exposing the youth to the current technology trends and how to prepare for the future in technology. All right, so Bincom community events is divided into five. You have the masterclass, you have the meetups. This is, this is um, one of the meetups, um, the Python meetup. We have the idea sharing which we have um, the ICT career talk. And we have ICT career talk every last Saturday of every month. We have explore and the move and we have challenge and brainstorm. All right, some of our other initiatives include Bincom Tech Network and Bincom Tech Club. All right, now the meetups, um, under the meetups, we have um, the PHP meetup, cloud hosting meetup, which was formerly um, Amazon Web Services meetup. We have the Angular meetup, Digital Marketing Meetup, Data Science, Laravel slash Year Meetup, and then we have the DevOps Meetup. And we have master classes, Bincom Startup School, Social Lender Digital Financial Services Masterclass, and Technology Enhanced Learning. And then we have the Idea Sharing Series, which include Bincom ICT Career Talk and Immigrate Open Day. Now, the next service there is the Bincom Global Tech Program. All right, um, which is um, the Bincom Global Tech Program is a solution to launch your tech career globally, which is focused on three key pillars. The first one is to learn skills, gain experience, and gain exposure. All right, so we have, um, um, we have this program which where you can learn tech now and pay later. All right, if you don't have the funds to pay for tech, a particular skill you want to learn, you can learn now and pay later. All right, um, which is, um, sponsored under the income sharing agreement. Usually the fee for this um, income global tech is 1.2 million naira, but you can pay later instrumentally through the income sharing agreement. All right, um, I would like to play a video that explains this income global tech program in a bit more detail. Things you need for this program. All you need is your laptop device, a hunger and a passion for IT. Those are the core tools that you need. The total cost of the Income Global Tech program for the period of one to two years is just 1.2 million naira. But you don't need to worry about that because it gets better. We have various financing options to help you cover the cost of the program. So you don't need to have any money to even apply or be admitted to the program. One of the financing options that are available for this program is the income sharing agreement. What that simply means is that the company will sponsor your learning. So you will learn for the period of one to two years and you only start paying back when you get a job and you start earning your income after this program. This means that aside from skills, experience and exposure, the company is also willing to invest its own money in on you. That's a total package. What are you waiting for? You need to go on our website, 
Income.net slash global tech. You need to register and then launch your global tech career. I'm sure that the tech world, the tech industry is waiting for a great talent like you. Thank you. All right, moving on. We have the Immigrate Service, um, which provides tech-enabled visa opportunities for people in tech, either the technical side or the business side of tech. Um, it gives opportunities to live and work in countries like the UK, the USA, Canada, and France. All right, we have the personalized consultation session, which is um, which lasts for a duration of 30 minutes to one hour and costs 200,000 um, Naira. And then we have the Immigrate Premium, which costs 1.2 million Naira. So to find out more about um, the Immigrate Services and Pricing, um, visit um, blog.bincom.net slash Immigrate Pricing. All right. We have the Bincom Dev Center Ambassador Campaign, um, which is um, a partnership with MyCircle. And it brings the ability for people to earn from the network and positive social influence. All right, you earn 10% from Bincom Dev Center for any office services which you refer. For example, you earn 10% of the payments made by a prospective Bincom Global Tech Program participant referred by you, which is 120,000 euro. All right. So to find out more, visit um, the link. The, the link is there on your screen. So, so yeah, that's about that. So if you'd like to reach us, if you'd like to contact us um, for inquiries or questions or any of our services, um, send, us an, send us an email at bincomdevcenter at bincom.net or you call the number that is displayed on your screen or you visit our website, www.bincomdevcenter.com. All right, um, are there any questions based on my presentation? Any feedback? Okay. Um, if there are no questions, if there is no feedback, um, I guess we've come to the end of this session. I would like to thank our speakers, Michael Adeyemi and Mr. Salihuddin, for being with us today and um, presenting to us and enlightening us on um, data visualization with Python. I believe many of us here are Python developers and we've learned a thing or two. And um, at this point, I'll bring this event to an end. Thank you for being with us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye. Uh, thank you for having me on today's event. Thank you. You're yeah, welcome, thank man. you all. We are very grateful. You're welcome.